everyone here, right? Good. So, uh, as Glenn mentioned, we're starting a new series that's going to take us from now up to getting close to Easter, anyway, over the next 12 weeks. Uh, it's called Jesus, the True King. And so, we're going to look at 10 kings in the Old Testament. Uh, we're going to consider their strengths, if they have any, because <laughs> there are some that there wasn't too much that we're strong on, unless, of course, you consider being bad a strength. Uh, and most important, uh, so just laying this out here now, so you can, we put these slides online and you can refer to these. In each message, we're going to be considering how Christ is all that the kings should have been and infinitely more. We're not just going to park and talk about this king and, oh, you need to be like this king because he did these things good. That, that just kind of, that doesn't really take us too far. And one of our goals is to see how we, and that is all mankind, fall short, but God's grace is greater. That's one of the messages that we want to get across very strongly. And the other one is to be drawn into worship the King of Kings and seek to allow the Holy Spirit to transform us into His image. So we're going to be looking at these kings. We're genuinely going to look at their lives, and if there were some good things, we're going to celebrate those. And what can we draw out of that? Life lessons that we can draw. But we're not stopping there. We're going to what all kings lack and are really pointing to the need of, and that is the king of kings. And the goal is not to be like David, not to be like Solomon, especially in certain areas of their lives, but not even in the good parts of their lives, but it's to be like Christ. And only Christ can bring about that transformation. So over the holidays, I uh, had some time, like a lot of you, with uh, friends and family, and um, on one of those occasions, I had a very vociferous or enthusiastic conversation with someone. I don't know, for me, it seemed like two or three hours. I don't think it was quite that long. Uh, but there were two big questions that kept coming up quite passionately there. And one is, why did God create man with the ability and freedom to, to commit such grievous evil? This was a stone in this person's jaw. And boy, did we hammer out that one for quite a while. And then one fitting in with it. Why does he, that is God, not do something about all the injustice in the world? And we went at that one just passionately for quite a while. And I think everybody uh, that wasn't in the kitchen, because that's where we were, were wondering whether we had gone to blows over some of this. It sounded so loud and lively. But it was a good, good discussion. We're, um, we're going to touch on that, those two questions this morning in our message. Why did God make us this way? And why is he not doing anything about all the evil that there is? And so we're going to be going in and starting in a passage of Scripture in a moment, but I just want to give you some quick background. We're going to be turning into the Psalms, so we're going to be looking at a 3,000-year-old piece of literature, a poem written by King David. And essentially, David is writing about how he, as king, was rejected by so many, and ultimately what he's bringing out in this very powerful poem is that rejecting him is rejecting God. And what this poem, this psalm reveals is it reveals the heart of man. And this psalm points out that man essentially rejects the Lord's king and wants to be his own king. Let's go to Psalm 2. Psalm 2, we're going to read if you uh, want to use the Pew Bible. It's on page 384. See if you can turn there faster than my phone starts it up. Sometimes it doesn't go as fast as I want. All right. See, that gives you lots of time if you have trouble finding, see? Psalm 2, 1 to 12. Why do the nations conspire and the people plot in vain? 
The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his, against his anointed one. Let us break their chains, they say, and throw off their fetters. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. And then he rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry and you be destroyed in your way. For His wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in Him. Father, we come before you this morning. You own everything, and you are all in all. Would you take what the New Testament tells us was written by the hand of David, by the Holy Spirit, would you take this wonderful passage of Scripture and open it up to us, open our hearts to hear. By your Holy Spirit, would you speak to us? Help us, Lord, to discern what you want to say to us. Help us to discern where we stand before you. We ask this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. It's quite a psalm, really. I think it's the only psalm that eventually we'll see in the New Testament. I think it's the only passage of Scripture where they actually say, Psalm 2. So they nail a force, make it very, very clear. What a, it's a powerful passage of Scripture. Breaks down into four sections, each with a different person speaking. And so I'm just going to walk through that and apply it as we go along. The first three verses are entitled, I've entitled it Rebellion. As a matter of fact, I think this outline I stole from somebody else 20-some years ago. I honestly don't remember, and in the end, you know, your brain gets filled with so much. What was mine? What was God's? What was somebody else's? I don't know, uh, but it works out as a great, great outline. So, as I mentioned, this is a 3,000-year-old poem, piece of literature written by King David. He's writing about being rejected, and essentially, he's equating rejecting him as king is rejecting God. And in this passage, he refers to the English translations, it gets lost a bit, but he's re referring to the Lord, that is Jehovah, the great I am. And when he refers to anointed one, that means Messiah, and the Hebrew speakers understand that right away, the Mashiach, the Messiah. And in Greek, and we have the translation in the English, Christ. So Christ means anointed one, it means the Messiah. And so David has taken this psalm, and what we know, especially as we'll see in the New Testament, this psalm is not just about rejecting King David, it's looking well ahead to the rejection of the Messiah. And as I mentioned in the beginning, this is very much, it reveals the heart of man. Because in these three verses, you know, why do the nation rage? Why are they doing what they're doing, the psalm and psalmist writes about? They take counsel together against the Lord, that's Jehovah, against his anointed, verse 2. Let's tear their fetters apart. Let's cast away their chains. Essentially, man is saying, you will not tell me what to do. God, you are messing me up. God, you are trying to wreck my life, and I don't particularly like hearing what you have to say. Go take a hike. In modern language, that's what they're saying. Well, this is actually Genesis 3 all over again. You go to the book of Genesis, right back when God had created everything. Along comes the serpent, and what does he say? Eat from the tree, you won't die. You'll be like who? You will be like God, knowing good and evil. 
Genesis 3, verse 4 and 5, what does the devil say? You will, surely not, you will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. Essentially, what the devil tempted man with and man gave into it was, you will be the determiner of right and wrong. You can do what you want. And Adam and Eve ate the fruit, rebelled against God, and the entire mess in the world has come because of that. But what we see in Psalm 2 is just a repetition of that. You will not tell me what to do. I don't like it. You're wrecking my style. This is the heart of man. And we see it over and over. Now, everyone in this room is in... You're obviously here. You could be somewhere else. I don't know why, but some people actually go golfing on Sundays. I haven't figured out why people go golfing at all. Uh, there's people that like to go snowboarding, skiing. That's a little more my style. Go to the beach. You, you get my point. You're here this morning because either somebody forced you to. Uh, I didn't hear anybody screaming as they came in here, except maybe the odd baby, right? Okay, you're here because you're either seeking or you are really interested. But you know what I'm talking about. The heart of man. The heart of man is, I really want what I want, and I'll do anything to convince myself that it's okay. That's rebellion. Well, fast forward a thousand years from when David wrote this psalm to Jesus' time. Okay? They had killed Jesus. They're persecuting the apostles. And in Acts chapter 4, so in the New Testament, so the book of Acts is essentially the story of what the disciples did after Jesus died and rose again and after the Spirit of God entered them and the Lord had said, Go and preach the gospel. So Acts chapter 4, they are hitting the same wall that Jesus did. The disciples are being rejected just like Christ. And so in Acts 4, after they've been persecuted, here's just a couple of verses, but you notice this is right from Psalm 2. So the disciples have come after being locked up for a bit, and they said, you spoke, so they're, they're praying to God right now, this is a prayer, you spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, your father David, why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? See, we just read this. The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. And now they apply it. They make it crystal clear just in case this is not my idea from Psalm 2. This is what God said and the disciples nailed it. Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in the city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus whom you'd anointed, whom you had made king whom you had made the Christ, the Messiah. So there is rebellion, clear. It's gone from against David to against Christ. The apostles make it very, very clear. This psalm of David is about Christ. You reject the Lord, and in it there is, I've already mentioned again, but we need to make this clear, these religious leaders, the ones who are supposed to be guiding the nation of Israel, they are rejecting the Lord, that is Jehovah, God the Father. They're anointing, the, they're, uh, sorry, rejecting the anointed one, the Messiah. And they said, you, Jehovah, you, Jesus, will not rule over us. So the same thing. Genesis 3, all over again, this is the heart of man. So what happened back in David's time, move ahead a thousand years, it's still happening. And guess what? Let's go forward another 3,000 years to our time. Is it any different? Is it any different? What's the heart of man? Okay. I got a visual I want to bring up on the screen here. Essentially, this is the battle, before we move on to the next part of this psalm, that I want us to think about is who is your king? Because way back in David's time, they said, nope. The time of Christ, they said, no. Well, what about now? Okay. Who's on the throne of your life? So essentially there you got, I've stolen this act one from crew, from uh, 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 C to P, to P to P, right? They keep changing their name there, right? But from crew, got it from the website. Great illustration. There's the throne. That's my heart. And S, the self is on the throne. There's a battle. It's one or the other. It's either Christ is on the throne or I'm on the throne. And what I want us to think about, and this is where we're going to go and how I'm going to close this morning, who's on the throne? Because Psalm 2 is about the epic battle of who is 
king who is your king. And that's essentially where this whole series is going. It's what's going on in the whole world. God says, Christ is my king, and the world says, nada, we're our own king. But here's the warning, just before we go on to the next few verses. Fast forward, we went from 3,000 years ago to 1,000 years ago to now, well, let's fast forward to the tribulation. I got question marks in there. I don't have an answer for when it is. But guess what? The battle's still going on. Here we are, Revelation 17, 13 to 14. They have one purpose. This is the world, the world leaders. They have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. They will make war against the lamb, but the lamb will overcome them because he is Lord of lords and king of kings, and with him will be all his called, chosen, and faithful followers. The battle started in the beginning in Genesis 3, went right on to David, right on to the time of Christ. It's happening now, and it's going to go right to the very end. You will not tell me what to do. That's essentially what it is. What's in your heart? You're here, but just because you're here doesn't mean this battle is settled. Who is on the throne of your heart? Who decides what you do and what's right and wrong? You know. I don't know. I'm not your judge. It's a question for me. What's in my heart? Verse 4 to 6, the reaction. So man says, they gather together, oh boy, we got our plans, we're going to do what I want. Well, what does God say? Verse 4 to 6. <laughs> well, he just laughs. Not because he thinks it's humorous and funny. This is laughter in the sense of, are you kidding? <laughs> you, you really think, we look at the power of the nations, the power of the world. You read, you know, I'm reading, uh, just reading, and uh, I think it was a, uh, I can't remember now because I read a few different online newspapers. I think it was the BBC, but reading about the Chinese now are dev uh, devising. They've got these electronic guns they're going to be putting on the ships pretty soon. They won't be using gunpowder to send their shells. They'll be using electromagnetic pulses. Like, you know, but you read about the power. They talk about the mega bombs that they have. You know, the, the mother of all bombs. The uh, Americans got that one. Everything's short of nuclear weapons. We all got our power. God just looks and he says, are you kidding and just straightforward, he says, I have installed my king. He who is seated on the throne. That's how it's worded there, okay? He who sits in the heavens, or he who is enthroned in verse 4, he just laughs. He says, you've got to be kidding. I have made my king. I've already installed my king. I've installed him on Zion. In other words, he's in Jerusalem. That was David at that time. But it's much more, as we, saw, as we see in, in the book of Acts, moving up to the time of Christ. It's Christ. He has installed him. He is my king. Well, let's think for a moment about the heart of man. Just, just straightforward. God says, are you kidding? I put my king there. And this comes down to the, you know, I was thinking about this, this as I mentioned to you, the, the discussion I was having with this person, okay? Like, why isn't God on this? Why isn't God? Why is God doing this? It's just like, you know, I get the questions the questions are good, but what's behind the question? What's in the heart? See, my heart is twisted. So if I think that you don't know how smart I am, I want to let you know how smart I am. If I think that you don't think I'm right, I want to let you know that I am right, right? You think I'm not in control, I'm going to show you I'm in control. Uh, am I the only one like that here? Is there anybody else? Anybody else? Got a few honest people, the rest of you are liars. Okay? Right? Okay. The heart of man is I need to show you that I'm in control. That's, we may be very subtle about this. Okay? So we can manipulate people. We won't, so, some of us are much in your face, and then some of us are just very subtly, <laughs> I'll get you, I'll fix your wagon. Okay? It's, it's really hard to not justify myself, to prove you're wrong, but let's get something really clear here. Almighty God is not like us. 
He doesn't have to prove anything. He is not in any hurry. But he's an absolute authority. And that's what the psalmist lays out here in 4 to 6. No. Okay? Do not be deceived by apparent inaction. And we get deceived. And we struggle with this. We could, we could go down this bunny trail, a very good bunny trail, just talking about why God doesn't seem to be answering the prayers of my heart, and my heart is broken. Some of you feel that way. Okay, the, the, and sometimes it's, it's arrogance and pride. I'll just do what I want, and God doesn't care. Other times it's brokenness and it's hurting. God, you don't seem to care. He does. Don't be fooled by inaction. Because God says, my king is on the throne. And there are implications of that that we'll get to in a moment. Verse 7 to 9 is the, real, the rule. Okay, rebellion, reaction, rule. See, so it's, it's really the psalmist in verses 1 to 3, or the, it's, he's speaking for the nations, verses 4 to 6. That is, the psalmist again is writing about what Jehovah, God the Father, says. Verses 7 to 9 is now actually what the Messiah, Christ, says. So it's David, but looking forward to what does the Christ say. He says, I'm going to tell you the decree, the law, the statue, what is immovable of Jehovah. Okay? I'll tell you Jehovah's decree. Fascinating passage. He said to me, you are my son, today I have, no, the New International, I think it's a little lighter here, says, uh, I like the New American Standard, today I have begotten you, ask of me and I will give you the nations as your inheritance, the very ends of the earth as your possession, you will break them with a rod of iron, you shall shatter them like earthenware. He said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Son? Begotten? Okay, this is speaking of Christ now. Not, this, is, this is way past David. This is speaking to Christ, Jesus. So when did God say to Christ, when did God the Father say to God the Son, you are my Son, today I've begotten you? Now, there's all kinds of cults that take stuff and they just run with this one. You see, God created Jesus. Jesus is not God. Okay, so we get the Mormons and the Jehovah Witnesses in there. Totally misunderstand what it means to be firstborn, what it means to be begotten. Well, the New Testament makes it very, very clear for us, actually. This absolutely had nothing to do with the nativity, had nothing to do with Christmas whatsoever. Acts chapter 13 tells us what this passage is about. So Acts, again, is the story of the apostles spreading the gospel. So here in Acts, they're in Pisidian Antioch. They're sitting down with a bunch of Jews, and they're sharing the Old Testament with them and preaching about Christ. And what do they say? We tell you the good news, what God promised our fathers, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus, okay? So they're telling them about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, right? They're telling them Jesus died, he paid for your sins, and he rose from the dead. And then what does he say? As it is written in the second psalm, you are my son today, I have become your father. You, you catch here? The resurrection is when God the Father looked at God the Son and said, you are my son today, I have begotten you. It's about Jesus rising from the dead. It's got nothing to do about Jesus being created as cults seem to think. It's got nothing to do with the nativity of him taking the form of a man and that little babe in the manger. This is all about the resurrection. And that's really, really important. You are my son. Today I begotten you. And he says, ask of me and I will give you the nations as your inheritance. This is about God's king, God's Messiah, the Christ. He won victory over death and he has written, risen from the dead, and all power is his. Philippians chapter 2, I'm going to read from there. One of the letters that the Apostle Paul wrote to a church 
in what is now modern, uh, modern, the area of modern Greece and Macedonia. What does he say about Christ? And I, I, I just love we, we, we could, You know, I keep telling you about all these series. I get these ideas of series that would be great to do. What actually happened at the resurrection? And how does the book of Hebrews and Philippians, all these books come together with what took place at this coronation of the king, in a sense? So he's describing Christ again and how he became a child, became a baby. And then what happens? He says, and being found. So he's describing Christ. You go and you read Philippians 2. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient to death, even death on a cross, obviously Christ. Now, what happened? What happened when Jesus allowed himself, humbled himself, died on the cross for you and for me, for my sins, all that I do wrong, all that I've ever done wrong and will do, he died for me. And what does God say? Therefore, God has exalted him to the highest place, given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every name confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Does that quiet in your heart or stir it? If it doesn't stir your heart, ask yourself why. Okay? Because when God said, you are my son, today I've begotten you. Here's this, try to picture this, this coronation in a sense of what we call it. Christ has died, he's risen, he's gone up to heaven, he's before the Father, and the Father says, Everything is yours. And we're going to actually close the series with Psalm 110, another coronation psalm of the king. Ask of me, I will give you the nations as your inheritance. God's promise. Okay? Let's go ahead to Revelation again. What's it say in the future about this king that when he rose, he purchased all who are willing to come to him, paid for their sins. God says, you get it all. Guess what? I get it all with him. Right? Revelation 19, verses 13, 15 to 16. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the word of God. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter, he treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I've got a question for us. Are we in rebellion? Or will be part of those, will we be part of those who return to rule? This isn't just fiction, this isn't just fantasy. It's pretty incredible when you think about it. Three thousand years ago, this passage of scripture is written, and there's so many of them like this. A thousand years later it comes to pass, and over and over again we see this. It points to this time, we see it, we see it happening, and says, Guess what? This is coming in the future. We've got to ask ourselves. We start this series, and as we go through, this is what I want us all asking ourselves. Are we in rebellion, or are we part of those who will return to rule? Will be, we be with him, or will we be crushed by him? Do you remember what my friend was asking about? Why, why, why isn't God doing anything? Do not be deceived by apparent inaction. Who is on my throne? Because every one of us has got a throne. Every one of us thinks we know what is right and wrong. Some of us struggle more, some of us less. But it's deep in there. Is Christ on the throne, or you. The last part, verse 10 to 12, is the response. There actually, there's a whole message here, just here alone. There are about at least five or six imperatives, five or six commands. We're not going to look at all of them. But the psalmist, now the psalmist is speaking, so now this is David. He's back here, okay. 
Here's the case. Now therefore, kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence. Rejoice with trembling. My translation says worship. Actually, I like the uh, New International there when it talks about serving him. So there is a statement about Jehovah, about the Lord. And essentially, what does it say? Serve him with fear. Here's the, here's the application. We talk about that. You have a message, right? And you have a message, so we've learned some stuff in our head. That's what's happened in this psalm. David has laid out, wow, he's just, the Spirit of God has re- revealed incredible things to him. But it's all head knowledge, unless it goes down here, right? So this is what the psalmist is doing. It's a great sermon right in itself. He's given us a great model. Here's the application, folks. So David, by the Holy Spirit, is saying, here's the application. So what do you do? To Jehovah, God Almighty, you get down on your knees. He is Lord. Submit to Him and give Him His place. That's really the opposite of Genesis 3. This is why, this is the epic battle. This is the battle that's been going on from Genesis right to the close in Revelation. You will not tell me what to do. And this is the reversal. This is really what repentance is all about. You want to know, what is is it about to be a follower of Christ? It's not about keeping a whole bunch of rules and regulations and all that stuff on the outside. It's in the heart, down right in here, saying, you are God. And I'm separated from you. I'm a sinner. Forgive me. Forgive me for shutting you out and choosing. And we can do it with religion. I can choose my own way and keep all these rules and make myself do all this stuff. It's got nothing to do. No, it is serve him and rejoice with trembling. There's two parts there. Serve him, but this is to the Lord. And then there is to the Son. And then he says, kiss the Son. What does it mean to kiss the Son? Okay? It's, it's to give him obedience, to worship him. Kiss the son, show reverence, worship, submit to him. There's only one command there with the son. And then he just warns. He just warns. What does he say? Kiss the son. that he not become angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled. And how blessed are those who take refuge in him. I want to go back to the passage of Revelation. I read verses 13 and 15 to 16. I on purpose left out verses 14. Let's go back there again. I've underlined them. Because here's the end, the epic battle when Christ returns, when this one who is the king He is the sovereign king. He is all that any king should ever have been. He is the living God. He is the one that God said, you are my son. Today I've begotten you. I'm giving you the nations. That king is coming back, and guess who's coming back with him? All who have bowed their knee to him come back to conquer and to reign with him. Now, those of you, I I realize I'm in Mennonite country. We don't like to think about battles. We don't like to think about war. We don't like to think about uh, violence. I did not write the New Testament. Okay? I did not write the book of Revelation. God did. He is dressed. This is Christ. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood. Whose blood is it? It's his own blood. Okay? This cost him his life. His name is the Word of God. This is Christ. Who's coming with them? And we could tie this back in. I don't have time to go back to the other passages. The armies of heaven were following him, riding in right horses, dressed in fine linen, white and clean. It is the saints. It's the believers. It's his children. All who have bowed their knee to Jesus Christ. All whom he purchased. And out of his mouth comes a sharp sword. And on it goes. And on his robe, on his thigh at the end, is the name the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Those two big questions of life. And then we're going to worship here for a few minutes and I'll close. Why did God create man with the ability and freedom to commit such grievous evil? Well, I got lots of answers that I can come through. I don't, I don't know that it is really clear. But what I do know is we have to choose. Every one of you has to choose. And actually, we have made a choice. 
already, already in our hearts. We've made a choice. And my question for you is we're going to worship, we're going to sing about the glory of Christ, and then I'm going to come back again. And what I want stirring in your heart and thinking about, have you made a good decision? Have I made a good decision? Who's on my throne? And why doesn't he do something about the injustice? Well, the answer is crystal clear there. He will. And really, this is all about which side of this epic battle am I on? Am I with the King of Kings or am I against the King of Kings? Let's worship.